Welcome ladies and gentlemen, we are still in Vancouver here and we are the offices at UEC, you remember Uranium Energy Corporation and with me here is the yeah, CEO Amir Adnani and we want to get of course a little update about the company but we also want to talk about the Uranium price as the prices started to rise finally. Amir, welcome and thanks for taking the time. Yeah, good to be back. <laughs> of course, first of all, Uranium was, uh, as you said uh, uh, earlier, um, the worst performing metal last year and all of a sudden it started to turn. What happened? Last year, 2016, really was uh, disappointing to see the uranium price uh, uh, fall by by 40%. Despite that, uh, we continue to see some of the strongest uh, long-term fundamentals with the number of reactors that are under construction worldwide. Mm -hmm. And with the fact that now with six years of just continuing weakness in the uranium market, the supply side is starting to really get thin. A sign of that really emerged uh, early in 2017 where Kazatomprom, world's mm -hmm. biggest uranium mining company uh, in Kazakhstan, announced 10% production cuts. Mm -hmm. Now you're starting to see, and this is the kind of signal in any commodity, you know, it could be yeah. zinc and Glencore announces cuts. Yeah. It could be oil and Saudi yeah. Arabia announces cuts. Which so they are, announced actually. And they have, all this has <laughs> happened, I know, I know. These are real examples. And these are real examples that you can yeah. see then causes a favorable move in, yeah. in that commodity. So now yeah. finally, after six years, we're starting to see the, in, the biggest player in the industry really take uh, uh, sort of action, measurable action, 10% mm -hmm. cut, mm -hmm. prices are low even for them and they're not only one of the biggest producers but mm -hmm. they're a low cost producer. And that's really had an impact on the market because the price of uranium got as low as $18 a pound. Mm -hmm. It's now turned as of today it's hovering around $23 mm -hmm. a pound. Uh, the price is still very low and marginal cost of production is 40 incentive price to build new uranium mines is 70 or $75. Mm -hmm. But this turn I think psychologically has shown that perhaps mm -hmm. the bottom is in and behind us. We've turned the corner. And uh, now I, I expect that we're going to see this be that turnaround year for uranium that many of us have been anticipating for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. I think it's here now. Yeah, we have hoped for it and finally it looks like we get it. And also I think Cameco just announced last week a 10% cut, right? Cameco had announced some cuts actually yeah. uh, late last year uh, with their uh, Rabbit Lake project, mm -hmm. their US operations. But, you know, you also have uh, really the changes in the political winds, you know, with the Trump administration coming in in the U.S., they will introduce a number of very uh, pro-nuclear, uh, favorable policies towards nuclear uh, mm -hmm. in the U.S. Also, they're expected to be much more favorable towards domestic uh, natural resource industry, including uranium mining. Mm -hmm. And so we also can't ignore that, that the last eight years with... Uh, under President Obama and um, some of the leadership in the U.S. Senate, like Harry Reid, these were not necessarily uh, the strongest voices for nuclear power. We now have some of the strongest voices for nuclear power uh, come back into the administration. Uh, UEC is in a very strong position because, as you know, our, our uh, executive chairman, Spencer Abraham, uh, was uh, a U.S. Energy Secretary, uh, the 10th Energy Secretary, and worked mm -hmm. with President Bush. So mm -hmm. he's one of the last Republicans to really make a mark in the energy business in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when uh, Spencer Abraham became Energy Secretary, he devised with President Bush the first energy policy that the U.S. had had, uh, a national energy plan, the first one in over a decade. And he implemented it successfully, mm -hmm. and they made very positive changes. So. Uh, I think you have to keep in mind that these political changes, I think, are going to be viewed and, and, and will be very favorable. Uh, and then on top of that, the fact that the supply side of the uranium business has become uh, quite challenged with these mm -hmm. low prices for so long. Mm -hmm. And that could cause really this favorable mm -hmm. response that we're starting to see. Mm -hmm. how, how does the supply side look these days? Can, can you give us a little bit maybe more of an insight? I mean, what is like uh, produced out of the mines? What is, uh, let's say, recycled, I would call it? There's a, there's a very interesting data that uh, UX Consulting put out. This is their number or mm -hmm. their statement, which was not a single uranium mine on the planet mm -hmm. makes money uh, at $20 a pound. Mm -hmm. So the all-in cost of some of even the world's lowest uranium mines, lowest cost uranium mines, uh, like in countries like Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. are above the $20 level. So you can see this is what I call no man's land. This is where no one makes money. This isn't about being average cost yeah. of production and certain yeah. companies being below the average. Mm -hmm. 
this is no man's land. And yeah. so to answer your question, the, what the supply side looks like is very dire, very weak. And when you look at um, uh, this, the, the picture, the supply picture, let's say uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. A big source of supply was the secondary supplies coming out of Russia. Absolutely. The highly enriched uranium yeah, treaty yeah. to dismantle the Soviet era warheads mm -hmm. and have that uranium be fed into the uranium mm -hmm. market for electricity uh, mm -hmm. generation. Yeah. That source of uranium was almost 20 million pounds of uranium annually, mm -hmm. more than what a, any single uranium mine produces. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. That source of secondary supply uh, basically ceased to exist or be available to the mm -hmm. market since the end of 2013. And so when you, when you look at the supply side of the equation today, uh, many of the mines are quite old, have been operating. You look at Rio Tinto's Rossing mine. This mine's been in production since the 70s. Mm -hmm. These are old mines. Mm -hmm. So they're uh, mined out maybe soon. Right? Yeah, and so I, you know, and there's, there's been maybe one or two new uh, significant mines come online mm -hmm. over the last uh, few years with just Cigar Lake and Husab in Namibia. So you, you, you look at what these mines have had to replace mm -hmm whether it's the secondary supplies out of Russia or some of the older mines that are coming offline. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't add up. Total mm -hmm. mine uh, supply being around 140 million pounds mm -hmm. per year. Yeah. So that's your supply side. Yeah. And, demand, demand? and demand yeah. is at about 180 million pounds mm -hmm. and rising. Rising, yeah. rising because there are 60 yeah. reactors on the construction worldwide right now. Mm -hmm. But then the question, who is filling the gap? Well, we've had oversupply. And you, we've had oversupply ever since... Uh, uh, the uh, nuclear situation in Japan with Fukushima. Mm -hmm. uh, as many people know that uh, the restart of nuclear reactors in Japan has taken uh, much longer than anticipated. Uh, many people were expecting that by this year, there would already be over 20 reactors back online mm -hmm. in Japan. Mm -hmm. And there's only maybe two or three back online. There's over 20 applications pending. So this is the positive news is that Japan seems to have every intention to turn more reactors back online. Mm -hmm. And many of these applications are under review. We could wake up any day and have positive news out of Japan. And that's mm -hmm. immediate demand that can help the demand side of the equation. Mm -hmm. But the last few years, definitely with the delays out of Japan, it's continued to create and have some oversupply mm -hmm. in the market. But um, this will resolve, and, uh, and it could resolve uh, sooner than we think. It could yeah. happen quickly. So that means the market was uh, speculating, I would call it, uh, on the storage facilities of those nuclear power plants because they thought they will yeah, never go online again, right? Yeah, and, uh, and, to, and to a great extent, you know, when you, when you look at um, uh, what uh, is happening right now outside of Japan, so we talked about Japan, we talked about U.S., mm -hmm. But you, we really have to, and I really encourage your viewers to do this. You know, you have to look up some of these videos from a couple of weeks ago coming out of Beijing with the air pollution issues that they're having in that, that country that right now. That must be crazy, right? It's a crisis. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. an absolute air quality, air pollution crisis right now mm -hmm. taking place in the major Chinese cities mm -hmm. and major cities in India. And the reason is because you have the colder winter, mm -hmm. so they have to burn more coal mm -hmm. to basically deal with the win winter climate and, and, and mm -hmm. temperatures. And the smog and the, and the pollution that's being caused by this, mm -hmm. uh, it's reached crisis level. Yeah. So we, we have to come back and really look at the full picture here. And the full picture is that the reason why 10 years ago people started to use the word nuclear renaissance yeah. The nuclear renaissance had to do with the fact that we need energy solutions that's not just about burning fossil fuels. We mm -hmm. need to have energy sources. We need to have a mix. We've got to have renewables, but we need stability. And nuclear is still the only mm -hmm. source of power generation yeah. that is large scale. It is around the clock, so it's base load, mm -hmm. but it is carbon emission free. free. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're seeing... Uh, environmentalists, you're seeing uh, people that are recognizing that in order to save the planet, in order to really be both green and have the electricity needs of the world met, we need to have an energy mix and we need nuclear to play an important part there. You see the air quality issues and crisis. It's another great reminder of that. And that is the reason why we say, well, why are there so many reactors on the construction mm -hmm. today? more so than six yeah. years ago before Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And these are the reasons why we're seeing this unprecedented mm -hmm. fundamental growth in nuclear yeah. expansion. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 
Let's talk a bit about UEC. Now we, can, we were well over the market. It looks all very positive. So yes. it's positive for the future of UEC, of course. Um, I mean, you have a full facility there. You can go anytime again in production with a little bit, uh, let's say, startup period. Yeah. Um, also, you got, uh, I think, how much did you raise? Like uh, over $20 million, $26 million, I think you got, which is a great sign of confidence, right? Uh, it, it really is. You know, we're, we're in such a... Uh, strong position right now with UEC because uh, you know we're one of we're one of only six or seven companies in the world that have facilities our own yeah. facilities to process mm -hmm. and package uranium. This is rare. Mm -hmm. This is very rare in the uranium business. Mm -hmm. And so and our, feeding projects, of course. Yeah, of course. Not to and forget. So, <laughs> well, so it really starts with what we call our hub and spoke. Yeah. Our hub and spoke strategy, and it you know. We got to take a step back. It really starts with our focus on in situ recovery mm. or ISR. This is uh, the the lowest cost way of mining uranium worldwide. It is the most environmentally friendly way of mining uranium. Mm. You have a, such a limited footprint compared to conventional mining, and, and UEC is really focused on this. We focused on assembling the technical experience, mm. uh, both on the exploration side of in situ recovery, using innovative techniques to keep costs down but using the institute recovery to make sure that our operations will be in the lowest quartile of mm -hmm. cost when we, as we ramp up and go back into production. Of course, we've stayed 100% unhedged, which means our hub and spoke in South Texas, where the heart of that is our Hobson plant, fully built, mm -hmm. fully licensed. Uh, we operated it from 2010 uh, for a few years before the uranium prices started to drop, and we put it on hold to preserve our resources. Mm -hmm. Our first mine, Palangana, is fully built, fully permitted. Uh, our, pal our second project, Goliath, these are all the feeds for the Hobson plant, as you talk mm -hmm. about, is fully permitted. And we use this downturn over the last few years to go and build the pipeline, mm -hmm. the pipeline of projects that can feed Hobson. Mm -hmm. And we had great success with the Burke Hollow project. Yeah. We acquired it as a new property, made a brand new discovery there. Not too many new discoveries have been made in the U.S. No, in the last really. few years. <laughs> uh, you know, we drilled over 500 holes, started the permitting. Late last year, we got the mine permit. And now we're just waiting on two additional permits to come in, which we expect to get during 2017. But so you really see that UEC as a, as a company, the pipeline of projects that we now have that mm -hmm. can feed our Hobson processing plant, that pipeline is bigger and more advanced than it was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And really outside of Texas is all the acquisitions we've made in Paraguay, in Arizona, and Colorado. So it's about really setting ourselves up with a, a, a long and, and, and very uh, extensive portfolio. But then, as you mentioned, the offering we just did. And, you know, we now have, in, in U.S. dollar speaking, about $28 million of cash on hand, mm -hmm. very strong treasury, only about 136 million shares outstanding. So still a very tight capital structure after 11 years of building mm -hmm. this business. Yeah, sensational. Uh, and uh, yeah. some very favorable uh, <clears throat> reports and coverage from analysts that cover the company mm -hmm. as well as four analysts that cover us. So. Um, I feel that uh, while 2016 was disappointing uh, mm -hmm. for anyone that was in the uranium business, 2017 is off to a very bright start, and UEC is definitely leading the charge here. Super. That's a great final word, leading the charge. I like that, as we have the charge here also. <laughs> 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 Perfect, Amir. Thank you very much. Looks like you are, yeah, perfectly cashed up, perfectly ready for the future. You have done everything right, and uh, yeah, the only thing we need is, let's say, uranium over forty dollars, and you are ready in the game. It's going to be a very exciting 2017, and I look forward to updating you as Super. the year moves on. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much, Thank Amir. You. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it was Amir Adnani, the CEO of UEC, U, uh, of Uranium Energy Corporation. You heard it, the company is sensational, cashed up 28 million US dollar in the bank. They are ready for takeoff, let uranium prices go a bit further. They have the mine there, they have the processing plant there, they have the future exploration there, they have uh, yeah projects for the longer term. Everything is there. Check out the company. Thanks for watching us. Bye-bye from Vancouver.